So first thing to notice is that oxalic acid is actually a diprotic acid. It could deliver not one, but two protons. When it delivers its first proton, it delivers that first proton at a pKa of 5.6 times 10 to the minus 2. Um, then it becomes this oxalate ion, or oxalate anion. This oxalate ion can also deliver a, another proton, the second proton, and the Ka2 for that proton is 5.4 times 10 to the minus 5. When oxalate ion gives off that proton, it becomes the divalent uh, dioxalate ion. So basically, we have to do an ice table uh, for this proton, and we have to do an ice table for this proton. And we are then able to calculate how much each of these are available in solution. So one important thing to realize is that if you have a bottle of 0.2 molar oxalic acid, you don't have 0.2 molar oxalic acid. You have some of this, the diprotic oxalic acid, the monoprotic oxalate anion, and then the divalent oxalate dioxalate anion. Plus you also have H+. Also notice from the Ka values, Ka is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 2, and Ka2 for the second proton that could leave off is 5.4 times 10 to the minus 5. The general trend is that the first proton comes off much more easier, easily, so the first proton that comes off is more acidic. The second proton, and third, and fourth, and fifth, if this was a polyprotic acid, here we're having a diprotic acid. But the second, third, and fourth subsequent protons come off at a less acidic Ka range. So here is our first equilibrium acid dissociation constant for our oxalic acid, the diprotic form. You're going to have to be able to draw this on an exam or any testing situation, the generic form of a acid dissociation constant. And this is going to be a Ka because it's going to generate H3O plus hydromonium ion or equivalently H plus. As stated before, the Ka for this one, for this reaction, is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 2. So we are told in the problem that we start off with 0.20 molar of oxalic acid initially. We're going to have zero of this and zero of that. We're trying to find these at equilibrium. So what happens when this reaction settles? Some of it is actually going to go ahead and produce the proton as well as the conjugate base. So we will have minus x, plus x, and then plus x. At equilibrium, this will be 0 0.20 minus x, this will be plus x, and this will be plus x. So the Ka for this reaction is defined as products over reactants. We do not include solids or liquids in our equilibrium expression. So we know at equilibrium, this is going to equal to 5.6 times 10 to the minus 2 at some temperature. Usually we'll assume it's room temperature. Remember, an equilibrium constant is quoted at a specific temperature. So the equilibrium concentration of H3O plus is going to be X. The equilibrium concentration of the conjugate base will also be X because they're at a one-to-one -one ratio. So I'm just going to go ahead and call this X squared divided by 0 0.20 minus X. Now, 10 to the minus 2 is a really, a it's not a significantly low number. Um, it's not like 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 9, where I know ionization is going to be very, very slow. Uh, the magnitude of 10 to the minus 2 tells me that possibly, possibly you could have a significant portion that's going this way, as opposed to something that's at Ka, for example, of 10 to the minus 10, as alluded to before, where you know the reaction equilibrium is generally staying at the reactant side. So this means I'm going to avoid my low ionization assumption and just go ahead and solve for x uh, utilizing the quadratic equation. So I'll distribute this and then get my equation in the form of a polynomial. So 5.6 times 10 to the minus 2 times 0.2 is 0 0.0112 minus 0.056x. Just went ahead and converted this to the decimal. And that will equal x squared. Now I'll get this in the form of a squared minus bx plus c, which then can be automatically plugged into the quadratic equation. So here's the equation that's ready to plug into the quadratic. So it will be minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all of that all, all over 2a. So here's my a term, here's my b term, 
and here's my C term. Don't forget the C term has a minus attached to it. So it's going to be minus B, so minus 0 0.056 plus or minus square root of B squared. 0 0.056 squared is nothing more than 0 0.0. 03136 minus 4a, a is actually 1, c, c is minus 0 0.0112. All of this divided by 2a, and the a here is 1. So solving for x, putting that in my calculator and solving 0 0.0815, and x also is going to equal minus 0.137. Now you can just go ahead and throw that away because you know that x cannot equal a negative number. So now let's go back and calculate our change x and plug it in back into our equilibrium values. So this will be 0 0.20 minus x, which is 0 0.20 minus 0 0.0815. So solving my x term, 0 0.20 minus 0 0.0815, it's uh, going to be the concentration at equilibrium is 0.1185 of oxalic acid. Notice you started with 0 0.20 molar, and when this thing settles at an equilibrium concentration, it's going to wind up being 0.1185 molar, and that is going to be nothing more than 0 0.0815 molar. So this is not the the right answer. Uh, it's incomplete because we got the concentrations of the full acid, we got the concentration of H+, and we got the concentration of the oxalate ion, but realize that this has a Ka2, a second ionization, and that is described by this chemical equation. So this can also participate in an acid reaction and donate its proton and you have a second source of H3O+. So let's go ahead and find out how much of it shifts and go ahead and solve for the concentration of the oxalate anion in the monovalent form, the hydromonium ion, as well as the divalent form of the oxalate ion. Now what is our initial concentration of this in our ice table? Initial concentration of this is the concentration that you calculated from the first ionization. And that is going to be 0 0.0815. So initially we have 0 0.0815. We have zero of this and zero of that. Now we're only doing this second reaction independently. So I know you may be thinking that we have H3O plus as 0 0.0815, but that actually came from this source. Let's figure out H3O plus that's coming from this source. So we'll do our second ice table here for the second proton that will come off in this diprotic weak acid. Everything is the same as before. So solving for Ka2 here, it's going to be the divalent form times H3O plus divided by the monoprotic form, products over reactants, we exclude, li we exclude liquids. So this was given to us at 5.4 times 10 to the minus 5. We know at equilibrium, this is going to be x, and this is going to be x, and this is going to be 0 0.0815 minus x. We're seeing how much of it, this reaction is going to go this way, yielding H3O plus as well as the conjugate base. So this is going to be x squared divided by 0 0.0815 minus x. And here I'm going to go ahead and utilize my low ionization assumption realizing that I could be wrong, and if it's wrong, then I'm going to have to wind up using the quadratic equation. So remember what the low ionization assumption tells us. It tells us that the reaction is going to go so significantly small in the forward reaction, or in the right-hand side, that essentially this x is going to be very, very, very small, and you'll wind up with essentially 0 0.0815, negligible amounts of reaction going this way. I make that assumption with a Ka of 10 to the minus 5, which already we know is going to favor the reactant side. I'm not very confident in my assumption. I'd be more confident if this was 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 12 or some other very low number. If my assumption fails, I'll wind up utilizing the quadratic equation like I did for the ionization of that first proton in oxalic acid. And by virtue of that, we're going to say 0 0.0815 minus x is nothing more than 0 0.0815. So substituting that in there, we have 5.4 times 10 to the minus 5 equals x squared minus, utilizing my assumption that x is really, really small in my ice table. So I'm going to get 0 0.0815. And now I'll just solve for x. 
If I square root that, I'm going to get this value of x, isolating the x term. And when I do that, I get a value of x that will be about 0 0.0021. I'll substitute 0 0.0021 back into my equation for my second ionization, my second Ka. But before I do that, I'm going to test the validity of my assumption. So the way we test our, our assumption is valid or not is we take our change x, which we have solved for here. So here I'm going to test if my assumption is valid. The way to test if your assumption is valid is you take your change x that you solve for here. And remember, we assume that this x is going to be neg negligible going in this direction. We're going to take that change that we solved for, 0 0.0021. We're going to divide it by our concentration of the acid that's undergoing the ionization. In this case, that value is 0 0.0815. And we'll multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. And doing that on my calculator, I get a percentage of about 2.5% ionization. So if you remember, the threshold is 5%. So if, if you have greater than 5% ionization, then you have to use the quadratic equation. But we are safe at 2.5%, so our assumption is safe, and we can c go ahead and accept this value for the change x. Concentration of H3O plus is going to be x, which we calculated as 0 0.0021. Now that came from this source. Plus, don't forget, we have H3O plus that came from the ionization of the original acid, the diprotic acid, and that was calculated as 0 0.0815. This was from our first ice table. So we need to add these guys up. Doing that, we get a concentration of about 0 0.0836 molar. By the way, I went ahead and calculated the pH. I took the minus log of that, and I got about 1.08. So this is in the acidic range. What is the concentration now of the monovalent form of the oxalate ion? Well, we have what we've calculated here as 0 0.0794 plus so have HC2O4 minus the oxalate ion ion, the monovalent form, calculated from our first ice table, which is 0 0.0815. So we really need to add those up. And adding that, we get a concentration of 0 0.1609 molar. So this one came from the second ice table. This one came from the first ice table. H2C2O4, oxalic acid. That came about calculating it from our first ice table. We got a value of 0.1185, as you can see here. Finally, so here is our first species that's in equilibrium. Here's our second species that's in equilibrium. Here's our third species that's in equilibrium. Our fourth and final species at equilibrium is the minus two form of oxalate, the dioxalate ion. And we calculated that from this ice table. And that's going to be this x, which we calculated it to be 0.0021. In conclusion, the diprotic oxalic acid this bottle contains not just oxalic acid. Because of the weak acid equilibrium, it's going to contain actually four species whose concentrations at the end of equilibrium we've calculated. The fully diprotonated form, it's a weak acid, so very little is going to go this way. But we won't wind up with 0.2. Because of some of this Ka1 reaction occurring, the final concentration that we got was 0.1185. The concentration of H3O plus, the direct contributor to our pH, was 0 0.0836 molar. We had to add this from the first ice table and the second ice table. The first ice table coming from this uh, Ka1 and the second uh, came from the second ice table, which is the second contributor to this H3O plus population. We also have a third member, and that is the monovalent form in which one proton is still left hanging, and we calculated that to be about 0 0.1609 molar. Finally, the divalent form, fully deprotonated form, we calculated that to be at 0 0.0021 molar. 0 0.20 molar oxalic acid is not 0 0.20 molar oxalic acid in the bottle. It's some of this. It's some of the H3O+, plus. it's some of the mono product form of the acid, and it also contains a small portion of the fully, fully deprotonated form of the acid.